Hello everyone and welcome to my third episode on networking technologies for ISPs. Today we are going to talk about redundancy in the network. We'll discuss why do we need redundancy and what are some things to consider while building resiliency for our network and what options do we have to uh, make these redundant uh, network. So let's get started. So first point is why we need redundancy. We want to give our customers the best of services. Uh, we want the network to be up all the time. We don't want uh, that some failure in the network should cause interruption of services. So this is the most important point. Then we also need to reduce manual intervention in the network. When something goes wrong in the network, we don't want that uh, someone should go to the place physically and do a configuration on a fresh device and then put it on and losing some time while the network is down and the customers are affected. So we don't want that. We want an automated system or a semi-automated system, you can say. We just don't want to build redundancy only of the network, but we also want to build physical redundancies and the resource redundancies. When I say resource redundancy, that means human resource also. You don't want to depend upon only on a single person who knows everything about the network and one fine day they leave the job and you are left with nothing and you don't know what is happening in the network so this is not good so you need to build a human resource as well as a physical infrastructure plus a good network today we are going to only talk about network redundancy we are not going to talk about other aspects of the network or operations of the business this is what a three tier network architecture looks like we have our access layer down at the bottom which connects directly to the customer uh, that is serviced through distribution layer and on the top we have the core where the interconnection to the transit provider and content peering provider happens. But where do we build these redundancies? Uh, these redundancies have to be built on each of the layer, the core, the distribution and the access layer ideally. Some people only build a redundancy on the core and the distribution that is that they have multiple vans they have multiple distribution points uh, so if one fails the other goes up but what we lag is a total network redundancy which is of the core the distribution and the access layer each layer has a different strategy that uh, we need to go through uh, there are different protocols involved and uh, we need to decide upon the protocol and what kind of uh, what kind of level of availability that we need as per our business needs. There are certain points to consider before you get into making a redundant network. Uh, you need to have extra equipment in stock. I mean, if you have configured the most efficient BGP or the most efficient OSP FMPLS solution or the most perfect MST solution, it means nothing if you do not have a spare equipment to replace it if it has gone bad. You cannot wait for equipment to come from some other city if your equipment has gone bad. You cannot wait for equipment to be shipped from your vendor to your place. And the customers will not care that you had built a very efficient network if you do not have spare equipment with you at the time when you need it. There are a lot of protocols involved and uh, you need to consider which protocol do you want to build your uh, network on because there are some protocols or some vendors which are proprietary to them that means if you use vendor a which has a protocol which is proprietary to them it will not work with vendor b and in that case if you want to shift to vendor b you will be stuck with vendor a so you need to be careful if you're committing yourself to a certain protocol which you know is proprietary then you know that you are committing yourself to a certain vendor so these are some points that you will have to consider. Creating of backups is another point. Even if you're not building a redundancy, this is an important point so that if any of your equipment goes back, you have a backup, you have the configuration with you that you can immediately upload to a spare device and bring up your network. The last two points that you need to consider is that you should know what your network is. Many times people have approached me for help and I have asked them for a network diagram they were not able to produce a simple network diagram. I had to request them that you can make it on a piece of paper and send it across to me on WhatsApp also, but they were not able to do it. And that is where the customer suffers a lot. Why? Because 
the operator does not know what their network is, what is working on their network, how it is working. This is something that each network operator should know. It is highly unprofessional that some operators, they are just running the network, but they do not know what is running on it. Somebody had configured it for them and they are just running it. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The first uh, redundancy that we are going to talk about is an access layer redundancy. Access layer works on layer two, as you all know. This is the edge of our network. That is, this is from the place from where we serve our customers. This is the end point of our network and this is the start of the customer end servicing part. We need to consider one protocol out of many protocols that are available that are based on spanning tree. So let's look at what are the advantages and disadvantages of each of those protocols. First up is spanning tree protocol and rapid spanning tree protocol. Spanning tree protocol or STP is a very old protocol. It's from 1998 that it was first uh, formulated. At that time, it, the idea was to build a protocol which could handle the ring topology of a layer two network. But the problem is that the protocol is very slow in convergence. It can take up to 50 seconds for port to change its stage to forwarding. Uh, that means for 50 seconds the network will be down in that particular segment of layer 2. Considering modern networks, 50 seconds is a lot of time. Internet becoming more and more popular, RSTP was formulated which is rapid spanning tree protocol. In many aspects it's very similar to uh, STP but the main advantage that it held over STP was a faster convergence time. That is Unlike STP, which used to take 50 odd seconds, RSTP takes very, very less time. It's in a matter of seconds that the convergence happens. But both of these protocols have a major drawback that these protocols were not made for a VLAN type of network where you had several VLANs in the same network and where you needed separate root bridge for separate VLANs. That could not happen with this protocol. To overcome this, Cisco had designed uh, their own proprietary protocol which was per VLAN spanning tree and rapid per VLAN uh, spanning tree. The main idea behind designing this protocol was that each VLAN could have their own separate spanning tree topology. Both these protocols are based on HTTP and RHTP respectively. So the convergence and configurations methodologies are uh, very much the same. But the main problem in these protocol uh, was that each VLAN had their own spanning tree topologies. In a network which had hundreds of VLANs, there were hundreds of spanning tree topologies being stored in the uh, switch memory and the CPU and the memory processing were very inefficient and this led to a problem. To overcome this, while Cisco had formulated PVST and RPVST, the international standards had uh, formulated MST based on PVST only, where the challenges of the previous protocols which were not converging fast and each VLAN were having their own spanning tree topology was overcome. In MST, the concept of instance instead of per VLAN uh, topology changed wherein all the VLANs which had the same topology were stored under the same instance and they had single topologies. So for example, there are 100 VLANs in the network and 40 of them have similar topologies. Those 40, uh, those 40 VLANs will be saved and processed as a single instance under MST rather than being processed as separate VLAN instances as under PVST. Therefore, in turn saving a lot of CPU usage and memory usage, therefore saving much needed CPU for other essential uh, switch features. Plus, because this is an industry standard protocol, so it interworks with between different vendors. So vendor A is compatible with vendor B and vendor B is compatible with vendor C. Therefore, there is no problem of inter-vendor uh, compatibility happening. So you can have different vendor switches in your network. You are not uh, bounded by a single vendor. Now coming to the distribution layer redundancy. Distribution layer works both on layer two and layer three. This is the boundary of the sparring tree. Beyond this, uh, only layer 3 network will work. This is also the layer which provides gateway to the customer. So customers connect to the internet, they need a gateway and this is the layer which provides the gateway to the customer. Note in today's topic we are just going to discuss the customer side redundancy of the network 
uh, we'll not be talking about the uh, redundancy between the distribution and the core and beyond the core we'll discuss that in a later video as i just told you that the distribution layer is the customer's gateway to the internet so the redundancy protocol here are the first hop redundancy for the customers the first uh, protocol option that we have here is hhrp uh, this is hot standby routing protocol uh, this is a cisco proprietary protocol it's created by, uh, between two routers by at least two routers who create a virtual router the protocols works like the customer and device does not see two routers but they see just one single interface to which they are connected to so in case the active router goes down the standby takes over but the customer does not uh, get to know about this hsrp has some limitations uh, number one is that it cannot preempt yes it is automated but still it has to be configured manually the other point is that there is no load balancing so the active router is the one which is going to be transiting all the traffic whereas the standby router is just going to be sitting there doing no work bringing in no business value uh, to the infrastructure like hsrp uh, the industry standard protocol is vrrp which is virtual router redundancy protocol as the name suggests virtual router this is exactly like hsrp that two or more routers create a virtual router a virtual interface that the customer and device sees which it connects to and when the active router goes down the standby takes over but there is no change in that virtual interface because it is made by interconnection of both the routers like hsrp even in vrrp there is no built-in feature of load balancing that is that devices do not have any kind of algorithm if it is configured plain as is one of the devices as in hsrp is going to be working where the whole traffic is going to transit through the other device is just going to sit there but vrrp has a native support of preempting that is when the active router goes down the standby router takes over and when the active come back online the standby hands over the connection back to the active router so this is a very very plus point the third option of routing redundancy protocol we have is glbp uh, like hsrp this is also a cisco proprietary protocol uh, that is that all the uh, group devices or the all the group routers that are going to participate in this uh, have to be Cisco routers uh, not when the ABC will not work uh, in this group unlike both the previous protocol this protocol natively supports load balancing that is both the active and the standby router support load balancing through different algorithms that are available which are round robin weighted and host dependent host dependent is your mac address space weighted is wherein you can configure which of the routers will take on what kind of load so say router 1 will take 80 percent of the load router 2 can take 20 percent of the load so you can configure it like this or this is plain old vanilla old style method of round robin wherein one packet goes through here one packet goes through here unfortunately glbp also does not natively supports preempting that is if the active router goes down the standby takes over when the active router comes back online the standby doesn't hands over the responsibilities of the active router back to it you have to configure preempting then only the preempting works otherwise it will not work to summarize today's topic redundancy is very important to the network because you are serving directly to a customer you are an operator you are a service provider you need to give the best of services to your customer there are a lot of options available in terms of protocols and how you implement redundancies. You have to select the best protocol according to your business needs. As I told you in the, today's topic, there are a lot of protocols which are Cisco proprietary. So if you're building a network on Cisco infrastructure and you know that you're going to continue with it in future also, then it makes sense that you can use those uh, protocols which are not available with other vendors. But otherwise, it will not make sense that you use those protocols when in future you will not be able to use it because you're going to change vendor or you're going to have a different a vendor uh, for different products some best practices you should have a network diagram yes i've written it three times in my slide also because people do not have a documented network diagram and you need to document what changes you are doing it is very important to document the change you need to have a time travel of your network 
what changes had been done any problems that you had faced because of a certain change that you had done you can always fall back to those changes if you have it well documented if you do not have it well documented you are just going to be blindly keep on changing keep on changing and this affects your customer this affects your the way you providing service your service level agreement and this in turn affects your business directly so this is an important aspect and the last thing is that you need to have backup even if you're not doing redundancy backup should be there because your equipment can fail at any time you need to have a backup of the configuration if you do not have the backup and your equipment fails you'll have to build everything from your memory which is not an efficient way of conducting yourself in network so you need to have a backup so you do not have to rush here and there asking for help at the time of crisis thank you for watching my video i hope you enjoyed it and it was informative to you i'll be posting more of such videos and i'll be posting some labs and practical videos also in future so do subscribe to my channel to get the latest updates please take care of yourself during this pandemic